While some people were speaking about how the temple was adorned with costly stones and votive offerings, Jesus said, all that you see here, the day will come when there will not be left a stone upon another stone that will not be thrown down. They asked him, teacher, when will this happen? And what sign will there be when all these things are about to happen? He answered, See that you are not deceived. For many will come in my name, saying, I am he, and the time has come. Do not follow them. When you hear of wars and insurrections, do not be terrified, for such things must happen first but it will not immediately be the end. Then he said to them, nations will rise against nations and kingdom against kingdom. There will be powerful earthquakes, famine, and plagues from place to place. And awful sights and mighty signs will come from the sky. Before this happens, however, they will seize and persecute you. They will hand you over to the synagogues and to prisons. They will have you led before kings and governors because of my name. It will lead to your giving testimony. Remember, you are not to prepare your defense beforehand. For I myself shall give you wisdom in speaking, that all your adversaries will be powerless to resist or refute. You will even be handed over by parents, brothers, relatives, and friends, and they will put some of you to death. You will be hated by all because of my name, but not a hair on your head will be destroyed. By your perseverance, you will secure your lives. Hello and welcome to Close to Walk Catholic Communications. I'm Father Byer, your host. And if it sounds like our gospel just came out of today's uh, soap opera, it's kind of scary stuff. It's kind of frightening. I think there are two things we need to look at. One is, see that you're not to be deceived. For many will say, I am he, the time has come. Do not follow them. Well, how do you know? Christ has died, Christ has risen, Christ will come again. How do we know when he's coming again? How do we know who he will be? When he talks about parents handing over their children, their brothers, their relatives, their friends, that's what he experienced. When he came and said, I am he who is to come, we know they didn't believe that. We know they doubted that. And whether you know it or not, all the 12 apostles, they were martyrs. Every last one of them was killed for their faith. And so part of this gospel has a historical perspective. And part of this gospel has a very present day perspective. Many will come and say, I am he, the time is near. You know, it happens. It happens all the time. And one of the funniest examples of Doomsday Prophets was I was in Dallas, and I'm, I'm going back 20 plus years, heading out for the evening. I'm watching the six o'clock news, and they've got a whole bunch of Koreans there. And it, you know, I'm talking about hundreds. 
And they've all got on these big 10 gallon hats like Hoss Cartwright used to wear, okay? You know, the big ones. I know I'm dating myself. For those of you who don't know who Hoss Cartwright is, it was a television show back in the 60s, all right? But anyway, they were doing a news story and it was a religious group. They had all moved from Korea to suburban Dallas because God was going to come back. <coughs> Excuse me. God was going to come back and appear to them on the Dallas cable channel number 34. And that's how God was going to reveal himself. And the guy's interviewing the people and, okay, well, what is the symbolism of the 10-gallon hats? And the response was, well, we wanted to blend in with the locals. And so they're all walking around. I mean, you can't, you can't make this stuff up. I, you know, I'm serious. And even though that appears... Oh, you know, you're, you're kidding, you're lying. No, I'm not. Real news story. Don't know the date. 20 plus years ago in suburban Dallas. And, but there have been many, many people. And, you know, and we've seen the Heaven's Gate cult and we've seen James Joan and we've, we've seen, what is it, Israel been Israel or something, uh, Yahweh been Yahweh. Yeah. Uh, you know, and I, I, I watch a lot of this stuff when I do uh, uh, cults and stuff like that. But, but, but the information about this stuff, you know, we all have to be a neuter gender and can't have sex for the rest of our lives and we've got to all dress androgynously and, you know, and that's how God's going to find us because there's no male and female in heaven and the Heaven's Gate cult is going to, you know, and, so they all, you know, drink the, whatever the, the, the concoction was, it killed everybody and they all fell on top of each other and found in a, in a house in Southern California and you go, who, who believes this stuff? Well, let me tell you who believes this stuff. There were a lot of disenfranchised people. There are a lot of people who feel like they don't belong anywhere. There are a lot of people who didn't grow up with family values. There are a lot of people who were not nurtured, cared for, told they were wonderful, protected, educated. There are a lot of people who live on the streets and at some point in time they come in contact with organized religion. And in that organized religion, more often than not, they don't find a welcome. They don't find Christ in the pews. They don't find Christ in the parking lot. They don't have anyone welcome them. They don't have anyone care about them. Some of them are earnestly looking, and granted, some of them have some mental and emotional problems that they're dealing with. But the people that they follow are the people who tell them, you're loved, you're cared for, you're special to us. We want you. That's what they hear. They don't hear theology. They wouldn't know if it bit them in the leg. That's not what they hear. They hear people who care about them, and they hear people who want them. And if they got to move down to Central America, you know, and cultivate bananas, they're going to do it because these people care about me. They feed me, they want me. And under the guise of being cared for and wanted, many people 
have been misled and many people have been exploited. Can I tell you that the people in Jonestown, Guyana, who drank the Kool-Aid, I think those people are going to heaven. I think the people who prepared the Kool-Aid, God help them. But these were people who were seeking God. And God love them. They were lost, they were alone, and they were misled. Doing what they did sounds crazy to us, but I think those people were searching for God. Now, the people who led them over the cliff, I think they will, they will pay for what they've done in the sight of God, but not the faithful people. So I want to talk about this doomsday cult mentality. And it's alive, and I'm sure it's many places going on right now that have not quite yet been discovered. And we always have the Waco, Texas, and we always have these events that pop up, and we didn't realize they were going on and how far it had gone and how disturbed it had gotten. But what's our role? Is our role to make fun of the people that we think are really off their nut and just out there? Or is it our role to be the person of Christ who walks the face of the earth and bringing Christ to people who are looking for it. I'm very proud of what we as a church do. I'm very proud of the work of Mother Teresa's sisters worldwide who tell these people they're loved, and the work of St. Vincent de Paul worldwide, and the work of the Hospitaller Sisters of Mercy who work in human trafficking. I'm very proud of who and what they are and the Catholic hospitals that welcome people and the Catholic education that gives some ch children hope who've come from really bad situations. I'm very proud of what we do as an institution. But the question I raise for you, for me, for all baptized believers is what part of that mission do we take part in? What part of that mission do we reach out and take all these disenfranchised people that are on the fringe, and there are plenty of them, and you don't need to go to Calcutta to find them. You can go in any city that you live. What do we do to reach out and to make this gospel real? No, I'm not he who is to come, but I am someone who believes in him who has come, and I'll bring you to him and I'll introduce you to him, and I'll show you what his love, what his mercy, what his kindness, and what his compassion is all about. How many of us take that role seriously? If every person took one person that they wanted to make a difference in their life, life for a lot of people would be different. Stay with us. We're going to talk more about this when we come back. Hi, I'm Father Jeff Bay from Closer Walk Catholic Communications. Thank you for being here today, and a special thanks for the support that you give us. First of all, your prayerful support we so desperately need, and also your financial support. We are donor-driven, and that would is what keeps us on the air today. As you well know, the truth is in great demand and in very short supply, and mainstream media is not gonna bring you the truth of the gospels of our Lord Jesus Christ because that's not socially acceptable and it's not politically correct. Certainly we all realize that when this life journey's over, we don't stand before the Supreme Court, we stand before the throne of God. Therefore, with great clarity and great charity, to pronounce the truth of the gospel is important your prayers, your financial support, 
enables us to do that. So we thank you and may God bring you closer in your walk with the Lord each day. God bless you. Before all this happens, however, they will seize you and persecute you. They will hand you over to synagogues and prisons and they will have you led before kings, governors because of my name. It will lead to your giving testimony. Remember, you're not to prepare your defense beforehand, for I myself will give you a wisdom in speaking that all of your adversaries will be powerless to refute. You will even be handed over by parents, brothers, relatives, and friends, and they will put some of you to death. Welcome back to Close Walk Chapter Communications. I'm Father Bayer, your host, we're glad that you can join us. They're going to persecute you. They'll seize you. They will imprison you. Wow. You know, it's one of the, the most difficult lessons that the young people in my parish had to learn was as they were all excited to go off to the March for Life in Washington, D.C. to join young people from around the country who believed in the dignity and sanctity of life. And they were going to have an opportunity to march together, to pray together, to learn more about the, the human condition and human dignity. What they weren't prepared for were the people who were going to attack them. Surround them, get in their face, and get very aggressive, and yell at them, and threaten them. Father, we didn't know what to do. No. No. And so, they will seize you, persecute you, you know, think about certain things that go on in this country. The owner of Chick-fil-A says, I believe that marriage should be between a man and a woman. Wow, where'd you get that new concept from, huh? So he believes in the scriptures. So we want to organize a nationwide protest. We've had cities that have kicked them out of airports because they believe in the gospel message. Really? I believe in religious liberty. No, you don't. If you don't marry anyone who comes to you, you're not inclusive and you can't be a tax-free organization and consider yourself a religion. Ladies and gentlemen, this is not some communist country. This is a land of the free and the home of the brave, one nation under God that is going off the rails at a very rapid pace while we sit back and remain silent and say, aren't they crazy? But, I'm going to ask you, how many times in the course of conversations do you refuse to speak your long-held, faith-based core beliefs and what Christ is asking of us? I disagree, but I didn't want to say anything because I knew I would upset somebody. So, who do we hear? We hear the people who reject the gospel values, reject core beliefs of Christianity, who've adopted a secular intolerance for anyone except the people who agree with them, and we remain silent. 
And there's no greater challenge than this today than on our university campuses where our children are ostracized, demonized, and really, at least verbally, attacked for upholding gospel values. And we remain silent. And a lot of us who don't agree with that continue, because we're an alumni, to support these institutions, and they are doing this to the next generation of young minds, telling them that religion has no place in the public life of our country, telling them that all these other agendas have to be accepted, have to be embraced, have to be participated in, and if not, we're going to run you out of town. We see it in the political, we see it in the political world. You know, one of the things that's coming up, and it's going to happen. I took the first bullet, but in seven of our uh, nation states, there's legislation trying to force priests to b break the seal of confession when it comes to child molestation. It's already law in Australia. You know what, baby? You can't be a little pregnant. Either there's a seal of confession or there's not. If I break the seal of confession because I am horrified by what was told me, either to the victim or by the perpetrator, if I break that seal, how many of you want me to break the seal and make public some of the things that you say in confession about marital infidelity, about addictions to pornography, about dishonesty in financial matters, about theft. You want that known? Of course you don't. And I don't either. And so there's a seal or there is not a seal of confession. But make no mistake about it, the church is under attack. When the Chicago School District receives, <coughs> excuse me, when the Chicago School District receives an average of three complaints a day about inappropriate behavior, you know, of a sexual nature between staff and children. And the governor and the attorney general order an investigation into all Catholic and private schools, but we're not doing an investigation into public schools. When you have a school system that cannot fire a public school teacher for inappropriate behavior with a student, but you can move them and you can put them in office jobs within the public education system, and you're demonizing the Catholic Church for past sins, I agree. Those things should have never happened. We need to suffer the full consequences of the law. But so does everyone who participates in those egregious activities that make victims out of children in horrifying ways. It ought to be across the board. And these are just some of the things. They'll persecute you. They'll march you before governors. They'll do all these different things. The other thing they say, don't worry about your testimony. I know that. I had eight and a half years of testimony. I had eight and a half years of having to know what to say. But in doing so, 
and I'm no great prophet. We trust in God. If you love his church, you remain faithful to the church, you practice the sacraments of the church, you rely upon God's grace, not only for persecution, but for daily life. We admit ourselves to the presence of God and we allow the grace of God and we humbly submit ourselves to God. We'll have what we need. Will we be spared persecution? I don't know. If you remember the words of Cardinal George, the late Cardinal Archbishop of Chicago, he said, I'll die in my bed. My successor will die in jail. His successor will die in the public square. And his successor will start to rebuild the church. What are you doing to start to rebuild the church? We start to rebuild the church not by involving ourselves in the political process. We start to rebuild the church by evangelizing our own families, our own loved ones, keeping and working to bring our children back to the sacramental life of the church and back to the submission of our own lives to the will of God and his church. When enough wonderful, faithful Catholic believers do that, we start to rebuild the church. Is there going to be a price we pay between now and the new evangelization? There will. I'm not going to project. The persecution has started. There will be white robe martyrs. There will be red robe martyrs. And as Pope St. John Paul II says, the blood of the martyrs waters the seeds of the church to grow. But I'm asking every one of you, take seriously not only the practice of your faith, but participate in bringing those you love back to the church, back to the sacraments, and back to the will of God in our lives. We thank you for being with us today. May each day bring you closer in your walk with the Lord. God bless you.